Not gonna lie, guys, this was a tough, tough list to make. I really had a hard time narrowing it down to just 10, but I think I've got my 10. Sorta. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back to talk some Dresden Files because, well, it's been a while. It has been a while since I've gotten caught up to the series. And for the first time ever, guys, I'm like you now, where I have to wait for the next book. So I think, uh, I think my tier list ranking was the last time I did anything Dresden Files related on the channel. And I've had a couple of ideas to go through, but I thought, you know what? What's one of the best things about Dresden Files? The characters. So we're going to kind of talk about my 10 favorite on it. Now, look, I'm not going to go deep into each one of these characters, nothing like that, because I have reviewed every single book in this series, including spoilers on the channel. You can find stuff if you really want to see me talk deep about them, as deep as I was willing to go at the time. Uh, I don't know. That could be something I'd revisit again later. I don't know. We'll, we'll think about that another time. But uh, I will say is that, guys, I'm not going to go completely full spoilers into this. But what this is going to be is I'm going to talk about where these characters are at currently. So if you haven't read all 17 books right now, I think you might want to go ahead and hold off on this video until you have read the series. And I very much encourage you to do so because it is excellent. So... Not spoilers, but spoilers, okay? So there, I have said my piece. So proceed at your own risk here. Now, when I said sort of, it's because, guys, I do have some honorable mentions, but it's going to be quick, so I don't feel like I'm just doing, you know, a, a top 10 list with 15 entries here. But I do have five, yes, five honorable mentions. And guys, this was tough. These were some tough cuts. First, I got to go with Charity Carpenter. I think that Charity is a character that almost feels like, uh, you know, when, you're, when your best friend's wife hates you. She thinks you're nothing but trouble. And I mean, let's be honest, guys. Is she wrong? But I, I think the relationship that she has with Harry, the growth of this series from absolutely like despising him to it being like a begrudging care about him and to where it, eventually where it gets to the point where like when Michael's in the hospital or Harry's like, he sees Charity, he's like, I'll leave. And she says, no, Harry, family stays. Incredible growth for that character. And then when you get more about her background stuff, just incredible, incredible arc for her character that I didn't expect that to happen with. Next up, this is probably going to have people flipping tables already. This, this is in the top 10, but I got to go with Mouse because look, Mouse is the bestest good boy there is. And I love an animal companion. He's one of my favorite animal companions. But when you start going into character doesn't have dialogue that's always going to hold them back just a bit so uh, i love this character i feel like if i'm ranking a list of characters that cannot be killed <laughs> or else i will throw things i think that he would be in the top five for sure but uh yeah that's why he's outside the top 10 here but but i love mouse to death i got nothing but bad nothing but great things to say even though you're probably saying nothing but bad things about me right now next up is sonya because you think about sonya his growth from death death mass to battleground is I kind of thought he was going to be the red shirt of the uh, of the Knights of the Round or Knights of the Cross, Knights of the Cross. I'm sorry, I've been reading a lot of King Arthur lately, but I thought that yeah, he was going to kind of be the throwaway. You know, I, I, that's kind of how I felt about it. There's going to be the one that was going to be the one who goes out in the blaze of glory kind of thing. But uh, yeah, his his character has just grown so so much, and uh, he's just he's beloved by the fan base now for a good reason. He's just a great character that is uh, you know loyal as anything and i think he's just awesome and i i think he's a character that really just sometimes uh harry needs like a, a, a dose of reality and he'll give it you know in as few words as possible and we love him for it uh uriel because who doesn't love a kick-ass archangel uh I, I i will say too many riddles bro to keep you out of the top 10 there uh i think he's very obviously he has a he has his own intentions, but he's just so cryptic about stuff. Sometimes it's like, will you stop being Gandalf and just tell me yes or no kind of thing. But uh, yeah, a uh, great, great character. And lastly, I got to go with Queen Mab. And she's been a late riser here. I think what she did in Battleground really, really took her to the next level for me. So I think that she perfectly straddles that fine line between good and evil. Look, she's going to do what she's going to do. But I, I feel like, you know, she will make the right decision sometimes. And I... Uh, there, you know, once you shatter away that icy exterior, I, I think that she does have a heart down there somewhere. So, uh, yeah, lots of growth still to come with that character, I believe. But let's go ahead, guys, and get into the top 10 here. Now, at number 10, I've got the, the daughter of Michael. This, of course, is Molly Carpenter. I love the growth of this character because she very much feels like the Ahsoka to Harry's Anakin. And if you've ever watched the Clone Wars cartoon, you know what I'm talking about. I really love that uh, coming-of-age story with her 
And I, now, why I've, I've never liked the the teasing the romance, even though Harry's always been like, no, no. I, I there are some people in the fandom that ship that. I think it's disgusting. Okay, you don't date your best friend's young daughter. That's just that's creepy, right? I would never ever come back from that. I don't care how smoking hot she apparently is, but uh, I think her growth from you know just being this twisted secret goth uh, you know <laughs> rebel from her parents to becoming all the way to the Winter Lady has just been an amazing, amazing journey. And it's, it's what, what Jim does so well with the series is I feel like you'll have a character that is just kind of mentioned or pops up for a second. And because this book series is, you know, basically like a year, the worst week of a year for the, our character. So you've been like almost 20 years now with this character. And you've seen characters that, you know, started as little tiny babies and now they're adults and stuff. It's just amazing. And she's a perfect example of that. At number nine, I've got old Blackstaff himself here. This is Ebenezer McCoy. Who doesn't love them? Some covert black ops. Some guy that's not afraid to get his hands or do a little wet work when it is called for. And I think obviously him being a father figure to Harry is very, very important. Uh, after after uh, what peace talks, I felt like their relationship status we filed under, it's complicated, obviously. But still, I got nothing but love for McCoy. And if anything, uh, I got to credit him for me calling everybody Hoss for about two years after I finished reading Trust in Piles now. So uh, yeah, it's a, a really cool character. I love me an Obi-Wan type character, obviously one that stuck around longer than Obi-Wan has for a, for that person that they're mentoring. But uh, yeah, you, I think that every time you get like a new layer kind of peeled from McCoy over the series, you feel like you've learned a new thing about him and it just keeps... The surprises keep coming. I want to feel like we know him at this point, but I'm like, I don't know. What else do we not know about you? Number eight, I've got to go with Bob. And <laughs> I know that probably should be a little higher, but guys, you really don't know how many I struggled. I mean, with this list, I just... People that were like from, from seven to two could have, you know, really easily flipped. But uh, I mean... I think Bob's humor is what makes this series unique. I love the idea of this crazy, powerful skull who has like all the incantations and solutions to everything, but he's also just like really horny and he loves him some strip clubs. You know, I love that. I think that's just such a fun, fun thing. And again, that's the kind of stuff that makes this different from every other kind of fantasy story that I read is that, yeah, this story won't take itself too seriously with things like this. But when those emotional beats do happen, they matter, you know. So I think that they, he's found a really, really fine line between a very, very Buffy the Vampire Slayer kind of way to where you can have the stuff that would be like, this would be a jump the shark moment for any other series. But with this, you know, Joss Whedon and obviously Jim Butcher know how to make it work. But uh, yeah, I love that's all fun and games with Bob. Once you learn a little bit more things about his previous owner and things like that, about this this thing is dangerous. It really is. It's like you're really holding a nuclear weapon, you know, in your basement. One who likes nudie mags, you know. So <laughs> it's just a great, great idea of a character. And uh, yeah, I, I love every little bit that we see about Bob. Number seven, I got to go with Waldo Butters. And I think his, you, I'm, I'm going to make references to Buffy and Angel a lot, guys, because that's what drew me to the series is my love for Buffy and Angel. I feel like his growth, uh, Butters, his growth is very much similar to Wesley Wyndham Price on Buffy and Angel. Goes from basically almost like a sniveling kind of coward every man. I mean, let's be honest, guys. If you or I saw some of the things that Butters was seeing, you'd be a sniveling coward little every man as well. It's not really an insult to him to say that, hey, because he wasn't ready you know, with bravado and ready to go fight the demons of hell, that he was a wimp. Uh, I think that that's a normal reaction for just about everyone. But you think about where he's come from, that every man to an ass-kicking Knight of the Cross. Think about what this guy did in Battleground. I mean, he was arguably like the MVP of that book. I mean, he kicked ass in that story. So uh, whether some people I've heard that they didn't like that arc, or they didn't like uh, how, how OP he kind of is now, uh, I've loved it. I think it's been a, a great, great development for his character. And like I said, I always think back to Wesley, who's just, you know, uh, <laughs> he couldn't fight off one vampire in season three of Buffy. And by the end of Angel, this guy is like a dual-wielding badass. You know, he's like James Bond, basically. So awesome, awesome development for this character. And uh, hey, Polka will never die, right? How about number six here? And this is a character that apparently the fan base is very divided on. I don't see why, but it is Karen Murphy. Uh, I don't really know why uh, things are so divided on her. Now, look, when I first started, I, I, I went through the range of emotions with her. I couldn't stand her to, okay, she'll do. 
I think I like her to, oh my God, I'm shipping her and Harry now. And I'm not a shipper guy, you know? That's kind of how the growth with that character went. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't like at first. You know, she was all she was trying to do was arrest Harry. And, you know, over time, it kept being like, okay, well, now she's, like, involved with this other... I, I can't think of the hitman's name right now off the top of my head, but she's involved with that guy. So I thought, okay, well, that thing with her and Harry, obviously, it's never going to happen. You know, they address it numerous times. I think it's proving guilty is the first time where they have the talk about why it's a bad idea for them to get together. And they just keep, like, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, Ross and Racheling it, and then when it, it finally happens, well, let's just say, guys, I cried. I cried twice in Battleground. So we have that. So to me... That says that uh, he did something really, really great with this character. And I don't know. I just loved her. She felt like if I got kind of my Buffy, tough, you know, blonde shit character in this story, this was it. I really do feel like that was an influence for this character, even though I don't know if it is or not. I don't know. I haven't watched every Jim interview ever. Even though I have interviewed Jim on the channel, I should have asked him that. But, you know, there we go. Number five, guys. I got to go with my favorite vampire here. This is Thomas Wraith. Feels like something out of an Anne Rice novel, doesn't he? Because... Uh, he's almost like the brother that I never had and Harry did have, you know. I think at first I liked Thomas. I liked him. I thought he was a pretty cool character. And then you get the big twist about, you know, their, their, their familiar relationship. And I was like, oh, my God. So I really, really thought that just their dynamic is just so good. It really does seem like like, like brothers would do, like uh, where Thomas will pretend that he's, uh, you know, Harry's lover. Or Harry will pretend that Thomas is a lover. Just things like that. They're just, uh, they're just fun. It's just, it's just a lot of fun. And I love that he's just so loyal to Harry. You know, he you never, ever question his loyalty at all. And I think his relationship with Justine is one of the most fascinating relationships in this entire story. But when I say I feel like he's almost like something from an Anne Rice novel, she always kind of did the thing about like vampires, you know, with feelings. That was something that she always was able to do without it being real like, Ugh. you know, she was able to do that. That it, it was a lonely way to live, you know? And I think with this, with Thomas, with him being like a vampire of the light kind of thing, it's just such a neat, neat idea. Uh, you know, instead of sucking blood, you know, they suck like life force and stuff. So great character. And I, I love some of the, you know, almost like the, hey, he could, uh, you know, turn to the dark side. It's kind of like, think about like uh, like uh, when Angel would lose his soul. That's kind of what it's like that. You can always think about, okay, what if he ever gets to that point? How are we going to stop him? So again, almost like a Bob kind of way. You kind of think about, okay, are you kind of playing with fire, keeping this guy? But I wouldn't trade Thomas for anything. Now, number four, guys, this is where the, the list might take a little bit of a turn for some people. I think that a series like this is only as good as its villains. And thankfully, this has some great ones. And my favorite villain in this entire series, even though he's only got three appearances in this series, that's what keeps him at number four here. This is uh, Nicodemus Arch the Own. I love this character so much. There's a reason that book five, book 10, and book 15 are my favorite in the series. I love the Denarian, the Denarian storyline, and I love Nicodemus. I think this guy is just amazing. When I first got to him, I always kind of felt like the other villains were kind of hit or miss, whatever. They felt like kind of monster of the week kind of thing. This was the first one I said, this feels like the big bad in a season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I love that he was like, no nonsense. He wouldn't wax poetic forever. Mr. James Bond, here's, I'm going to tell you my whole plan. And then you're going to get away and know what I'm doing. No, he'll just flat out just like, yeah, kill him. You know, whatever. He will do whatever it takes. He will sacrifice those that are close to him. It does not matter to get his end goal. This guy is all business and I love it. I think he's just a phenomenal, phenomenal character. Some of the best, some of the best uh, moments, I think, in the series. And those moments where you'll kind of just be like, you know, what he's saying right now, I get why we can't do it, but it does make a lot of sense. You know, it's, it's one of those kind of things. So yeah, just pure evil, just pure, pure evil, but not in a mustache twirling kind of way. He has goals and he has reasons. And um, yeah, I find myself like, it's one of those kind of things where maybe I've read too much uh, Grimdark where I'm kind of like, wow, am I kind of like rooting for <laughs> Nicodemus right now? So yeah, just an awesome, awesome character. I, I can't get enough of this one. Okay, now for my top three here, guys, I'm gonna be honest with you, any of these three could have been number one. They could have. I honestly did flip a coin between three and two. So I was pretty sure I knew who my number one was, but between three and two, I flipped a coin. At number three, I've got the gentleman, Johnny Marcone. Now I have loved Mark Hone, since the very first book when Harry soul-gazed him, 
and Marcone didn't flinch. I thought that was just such a badass moment. So right away, I was like, okay, this is this is great. You'd love like some, you know, underground organized crime kind of storyline. I think he's one of the best. This is straight out of something from like, you know, early Batman or something. He he on on the surface, you would think, okay, look, he's a mobster, he's just a bad guy, he hurts people and things like that. The more you get to know about him, the more you give a damn about him. And the fact that this guy gets results. He gets results. I think some of the best moments in this series are when Marcone and Harry are forced to work together. Not only is their banter top-notch, but they work really well together. It's what I've always kind of made the comparison of, of this, those, those uh, issues where Superman and Lex Luthor have to work together and they get really good results. It's a lot like that. But you know, hey, you know Lex is going to screw him over in the end. Kind of the same here with, with Marcone. He's not necessarily going to screw him over as much as he's going to keep his best interest at heart. Even if when the chips are down, he does have a little bit of that heart of gold. He's not just a monster. And I think that's why I can't say, well, I'll say Nicodemus is the best villain in the series because I feel like Marcone is very, uh, I wouldn't say he's a morally great character, but I feel like he's about three-fourths this way. <laughs> you know, I feel like there's a lot more good in him, obviously, where Nicodemus has no good in him. So I'm not going to call him a straight-up villain because, I mean, like, you look what he did in Peace Talks and Battleground. The guy's awesome. He is just a great, great character. But, uh, yeah, uh, goal-oriented. I would never call him nice. But uh, like I said, he makes the right choices, I think, when the chips are down. And uh, now that I feel like he's arguably on a similar power level with Harry, I go back to what I've always kind of went back with these two. I do not think this series ends without one of these two going up in Fuego, right? So uh, I, I will... I will just pretend, la, 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 you know, my friends are fighting kind of thing when that moment happens. But number two, we got to have Harry Dresden, right? Because look, guys, that's why we're all here. I, I love Harry because he feels like a less damaged version of John Constantine from Hellblazer, which is a series that I love and a character that I adore. I, I think that's just one of the most intriguing characters ever. And I felt like there was a lot of that character here, but not clearly. He's a, he doesn't have cancer. He's not just eternally grumpy. Uh, he'll, he'll 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 pop off some one-liners. Uh, he'll do a lot of pop culture stuff that I love because obviously Jim grew up in the same generation as me. But uh, all the bad things that happened to him, you know, he never really loses that flicker of optimism. I think that that's what makes Harry such a great character. Is no matter how many times he gets knocked down, he gets back up, you know. And, and the thing is, is uh, if anyone had ever told me, I, I can't remember what, when I first started reading this series, someone had popped in the comments and said, ah, I tried reading the stories, but Harry was, he was just too much of a Mary Sue. And I was like, I don't get that at all. Harry gets knocked out every book. He's very much like Harry in that other Harry wizarding book called Harry Potter, where it's like, you know, you do have your big moment each book, but it's like all the people around you that are doing a lot of this stuff. And that's great. That's what makes both of these series go around. But uh, yeah, every opportunity that Harry has to become Darth Vader, he stays in the light. You know, And I think that that's a very, very important message. And that's what makes him just an amazing character. And uh, it's why, you know, 17 books in, we still haven't gotten enough of Mr. Dresden. So number one, if you've followed the channel for a while, you know the answer to this. Ever since I read Grave Peril, Michael Carpenter has been my favorite character in this series. I don't know if it's because of my love for like, you know, uh, the Arthurian legend or whatever. I feel like this is basically if you had a knight of the round table in current day time, just chivalrous and, and you know, still very much living the way that a knight would live. And he's just the, the, the most awesome friend. You know, he's always there for Harry anytime he needs, very much pissing off his wife. You know, but he's basically the best friend that I feel like anyone could 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 uh, ask for. And, and, you know, there's nothing that he would not do for Harry. And he proves that time and time again. I feel like he has some of the best speeches in this series. Some of those moments where it's just him and Harry talking are some of my favorite in the entire series. And that just makes his character just so endearing to me. And when he had that accident, and then uh, was it Turncoat? I think when he had the accident, I was devastated, you know, because I thought that was it. I thought Jim had, had finally pulled the plug. So, you know, even though he's very much a sideline player at this point in the story where he's at now, because I feel like this is going to be that kind of series where it will kind of pass the torch a little bit to some of those younger characters, which obviously, you know, he's done to uh, for, for Butters, I, I still think that it will take a lot a lot for someone else to knock Michael off this spot because he's just the best. Even a book like, uh, was it either Peace Talks or Battleground? I can't remember this point, but even a book like that where he finally breaks character and he's dropping all this bad language and different languages and stuff. It's just, it's a hoot. It's the things that makes Michael Carpenter great. It's the things that make this series great, guys. So that was my 10. 
there are some tough cuts, guys, that I didn't even get into honorable mentions because this series has so many great, great characters. So this was very, very difficult for me. Yeah, I have only read this series once. I did read them all in about the span of about eight months. So uh, some things might not be as fresh up here as you know they were while I was reading it. But you know, off my memory, these are the 10 that I would say, okay, you're making me gun to my head. You're making me pick 10. These are the 10 that I would pick. But what I am more interested in knowing, guys, is what are your 10 or just what are your five? What are your favorite characters in the series? I always prefer to hear your list over hearing why mine is lousy, but these things happen. So guys, drop in the comments and let me know what you think and I will fuego you there.